three, two. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Checker Phil, representing the Checkerboard Kids program. Today on the Checkerboard Kids program, we have a, a round table. I know it's not round, all right? Don't sue me on this one. But we, we, we're going to have a, a literal round table about music, about the future of music, where it's going, where's it been, what's going on with that. Um, let me introduce my guest to the right of me, um, Dr. Aram Sinarik. Hi, everybody. Yes, yeah, he's a media professor at Rutgers University. He's also the bassist for Brave New Girl and also Dubistry, too. Can I get yeah. that in there? A plug for that? Why not? And then to his right, let's hear it for Cooley Ranks, uh, world famous producer, performer from the Pilfers, uh, from Pilfers, and a uh, special voice uh, in Grand Theft Auto 4. Mm, little Jacob. Little, little Jacob, Jacob representing. Right. And last but not least, Scott. Scene. Oh God! I'm so <laughs> it's all right. You just, you just ran right past it. Sorry, man. Yeah. Well, and, and he's from he's a songwriter and composer from Real Big Fish. Fish? I can't even say fish. And the Littlest Man Group. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, everybody here, uh, our, our panel of. Uh, our panel uh, are, are well qualified in the in the world of music. I mean, me personally, I just like music. And but but don't worry about me. Let's listen to these guys and what they have now. Aram uh, has just uh, written a book about music and uh, tell us about this book first. It's called Mashed Up. Uh -huh. The basic idea is that music is a kind of sonic controlled substance. And there's always been this war going on between uh, people who want to control what happens inside our brains through music and people who want to have liberation in their brains through music. Mm -hmm. uh, and the new technologies that are allowing us to create new forms of music like mashups and remixes and hip hop and house and techno are basically redrawing the political lines uh, of the battlefield on which these wars take place. Whoa, so this, this is the new future of music. What do you guys think about that? Just whoa, doing... whoa, whoa. I will definitely read that book. <laughs> Holy smokes. I mean, I didn't realize we were going to have a doctor on the panel. I, 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 I just play one on we TV. We were having a know. conversation before, and like now I feel like I'm like going back through everything that I said, and I was like, if I'd known I was talking to a doctor. <laughs> Jiminy. Oh, oh no, this so is, I tell you, no, we, we sit and we, we talk about music and I'm just like, whoa, sometimes I have to like just chill back and say, mm, what's up with that? I'm, I'm a big nerd. That's basically what it comes down to. <laughs> but so, so, so you're, you're basically dumb it down for, for me, the, the layman over here. Um, now, what about, is this more like corporations taking over a mind and like making like that of like a Hannah Montana or, or, or the commercialized music as opposed to... Um, you know, normal underground music? Well, if only it were that simple. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, we're just, you know, we're as much a part of the problem as we are a part of the solution. What? As well, you know, each of us in our own lives, we play many different roles, right? We play the role of a TV host, mm -hmm. but we also play the role of, a, 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 in your case, an elementary school teacher. Mm. High school right? teacher. Right? So you're, sorry, my apologies, a public high school okay. teacher. So in your case, even though you're, I, I know from knowing you for 20 some odd years that sure. you're an amazing teacher and a very inspiring person, you're part of an institution uh, that as its ground rules, trains people not to be creative from the very foundation. And every day of your life, I would guess, entails some kind of struggle against that institutional bulwark against encouraging creativity. Word. Wow. That is word. And so, you know, each of us in our own little ways are fighting on both sides of, of the fence. If only it were a bunch of big, bad corporations, uh, we could just firebomb everything and, and start life anew like a fight club. Uh, but, you know, we can't firebomb ourselves. Hmm, okay, so, well, all right, now, now, now you guys are, are guys that make music, so do you find a, you know, what do you find of this? Well, I think that's, that's always, I mean, an interest, I, I, I was, you know, everybody's always, you find, like, in big things like that, everybody's always got, like, there's, there's, there's the demonized, you know, villains and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. there's always two sides to everything, and we, you know, like that, they saw that movie on the, you know, Who Killed the Electric Car, sure. it's like, you know, I'm finding nine times out of ten in a lot of these situations where we have these moments where we're actually all robbing ourselves of beautiful, incredible things. Mm. Um, uh, I, I, you know, there was the, there's the, as far as education goes, there's the no child left behind thing that, you know, took place and, you know, where 
I have a lot of teachers in my family uh -huh. that it's very frustrating when you used to be able to teach on a whole myriad of things and now it's like biology is boiled down to eight words. Yeah, teach like to the test. You have to know what these to eight to words the are get me started. and just these eight words and then and you're good. Kentucky, God is one of those eight words. Right. I yeah. mean, it's it's incredible, you know, and we're... Uh, there's an incredible book by none other than C.S. Lewis. Most people really? are familiar with the Narnia series, yeah. what have you, but his, his, his essay is an adult fiction, are actually incredible. But he wrote this book called The Abolition of Man, and it talks about how we are making ourselves a weaker species through education. We are taking things and also implementing into the education of children that emotions are, 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 are you know, unimportant and 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 a lot of it comes through uh, just simple phrasing of textbooks and mm -hmm. things like that but I mean if you take away the value uh, of feelings and emotions whether you know on any level then all of a sudden you're obviously going to be stifling creativity mm -hmm. because that, that, that's that's the bedrock yeah a lot of educational know? institutions nowadays have been trying to find ways to try and cut art and music right out of there, and thus stifling the kids' creativity right now, like nipping it right in the bud. Absolutely. That's a huge part of it. But there's also the kind of larger game that goes on, which is even if, ed uh, if, if education contains a component that's about music, the question is how are we taught to understand it? So we have these concepts that seem to be so obvious that we don't even need to say them. There's a difference between a musician and an audience member, right? There's a difference between something that's a work of art and something uh, that's just, uh, you know, a, a craft, something that, that we would just make with our hands and, and be done with. These kinds of fundamental distinctions that, that, that are the basis of the language we use to talk about music contain really powerful ideas. And over and over again, the idea is that a very small number of people should make stuff while the rest of us should absorb the stuff. A very small number of things are so special that they should be elevated to this uh, higher plane of existence while everything else is kind of mundane and, and to be hated and disposable. Uh, those ideas actually did not exist for most musical cultures throughout most of civilization. This is a particular neurosis of Western society that's only been around for about 200 years. Hmm. So part of what we're doing uh, is, is, and it's a beautiful thing that's happening right now, but as a collective society, we are in the process of training ourselves to forget what we thought we knew about music and about art. So if you look at DJs, if you look at the work that mashup artists are doing, artists, um, you know, you're taking the work of person A and you're mashing it, mashing up it up with the work of person B. Um, you are are not making any claims to being an artist, and yet you're imprinting your own worldview and your unique standpoint onto that, uh, onto that the sound of the music itself. It it undermines the concept that there can be one person whose job it is to develop intellectual property and someone else's who job, whose job it is to appreciate that property. It, it shows us that, that all creativity is fundamentally collective uh, and requires everybody to participate. Now, cool, you're, you're a record producer, right? You, you do some, yeah, yeah. some producing. All right, so now, um, also, if you think back to a lot of Jamaican music, um, like uh, the DJs out there spinning the dub plates and stuff like that for different tunes and things like that, and people would just come out and chat over it, and you do do some chatting, I would say, right? Mm, a little bit of that. All right. And um, so what, what, what do you notice? Is, is there an intellectual property kind of thing going on there? It's just people just doing it. It's a thing of the people. It is a thing of the people. Um, as far as uh, reggae music is concerned, sure. or even ska music that, right I, on. that I do, it's all honest. Mm -hmm. You say what you f you say what you feel, and that's how you you get your you get your point across. Basically, you're just saying how you feel. It's not so much geared towards the buying public. Right. And different styles. And I mean reggae music. I don't mean dancehall music. Yeah. Dancehall music is kind of following what's going on with what's going on in America. Are they genre. Where they're trying to make some money. But mm. reggae music on the whole is more honest and more spiritually based, and you know. Deals with your, deals your emotions. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever, have you ever, uh, like, done a version and had somebody who didn't understand reggae say to you, like, what are you doing? You're just, you know, you're just uh, singing or chatting over someone else's beats. Like, why don't you do something original? Have, have you ever had somebody say that kind of a thing to you? Um, no, because I make on. Excuse me. <laughs> the gentleman says I should remove my hair. Uh, <laughs> so I did that and it never came back. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, see, I do, I do original music. Right. So, so you never work with versions. You never work. With I don't do that. I don't do that. Okay. I always do original music, 
because I don't I know the the industry mm -hmm. the industry if you use someone else's music you're gonna have to pay them for their music so mm -hmm. so you're saying creatively you would be interested in doing that but it's such I've a done that as a child no no, no I've done that as a child for me that was a stepping stone right. into being an artist you right. had these these uh, versions instrumentals and you practice on that that was just how you got started in mm -hmm. the business but as I progressed I started moving on with more um, musicians so they was like cool ranks not original music mm -hmm. I was like, okay, that was it. That's interesting. That's the original music. So do you think that the reggae ethic has moved away from the kind of collectivism of the original dub philosophy? No. I don't think, I know. So That's a same, good question, brother. Wow. Well, I don't, I, I don't think it's, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's moved away. I think there's branches of everything. There's always been that element within reggae music. Mm -hmm. There's been music that is sung over and music that has been created. And that's always going to be in reggae music because Jamaican people are very creative and that's just the way it is. Well, what about rhythms, right? So yeah. there's like the style, like whether right, it's right. you know, murder or whatever. Right. Um, but that's our history, though. Well, well, that's my point. But, you know, uh, uh, Bo Diddley, you know, an amazing American musician, uh, went to his grave claiming that he should have received royalties for chank, ka chank, ka chank, ka chank, chank, right? Which is an African bell pattern that goes back umpteen thousand years. Right. But he believed that that rhythm had been stolen by, you know, um, uh, Buddy Holly, right? I'm going to tell you how it's going to be. And in, 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 in Jamaican music, unless those rhythms were available to everybody to participate with, you wouldn't have the music at all, right? Right. So, I mean, where, where do you stand? I mean, let me ask you, as a, as, a comp as a composer and as a producer, at what point do you say, okay, what I've just done is mine. I've added something to it, and this is mine. My name belongs to it. I own this piece of culture. Well, you know what? I, I try to do that with my music, and my friend told me, no, it's for the world. Oh. You understand? I try it. The music that I do. Oh, they're freaking me out when they're talking. <laughs> they're freaking me out. There is no camera. Yeah. Oh, um, the music that I did, you know, I've done this reggae rag core type thing, right? So mixed rock with reggae and mm -hmm. all kind of other beats. And I wanted to be like this. This is mine. I created this. I'm I'm the originator of this music. But my friend was like, No, this is for the world. You can't keep it for yourself. This mm -hmm. has to be for everyone else to use. So there is no real ownership uh, to claim. Right. So, Imagine well, there's, like for Scott. I can't. I, there's I mean, two levels to it, I think, because there's first of all, there's there's the, there's a, there's a personal ethic right. of where you have gone far enough to where you're saying, Okay, I'm biting. Like straight right. up, just I, like right, right, ganking right. someone's either style or a div chord progression or a melody or what have you, you know. Right. And sometimes you're paying homage, you know, like and 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 sometimes you're just biting. But then there's also, I mean, with, with any musician who's trying to make a living or do anything, we're, there's we're all trying to see how far we can push, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's like, and then we get we get hit by those legal parameters, which is mm. what? Uh, what's the? Is it? That's eight, how many it's bars? Eight there's no. There's there's no there is no, it does not exist. There's no legal foundation what? for the myth of the three seconds. So what is it that the, the, the sample? Yeah. There's the, okay. What's so the precedent? I, I'm going to make it really simple. Cool. What, what is a super complex uh, bunch of case law? The concept that there is a threshold beneath which you can take stuff is called de minimis. That's just Latin for the minimum, right? Uh, or of the minimum. For for taking someone's composition. Uh, there is a de minimis threshold that has nothing to do with how many bars it is or how many seconds it is, but whether or not it steals what's called the heart of the work. I kid thee mm. not, that's actually the legal terminology, mm. the heart of the work. It actually um, kind of gives me hope for the law. Yeah, but for sampling, <laughs> there's no de minimis law. So, for instance, the Beastie Boys, right, who sampled James Newton, they took uh, five or eight seconds of a song of his, mm -hmm. and they were not guilty of infringing his composition. Wow. Wait a second, but, but, wait a second, but versus De La Soul, NWA mm -hmm. took two seconds of Parliament Funkadelic, put it through all kinds of mixers and reverbs and echoes, played it backwards, and because it was a sample and they didn't clear the phono rights, they were guilty because there is no de minimis for sampling. So there's a total double standard depending on. And, and Do you think it's way, racist? Ah, sorry, just throwing it out there, folks. I, I, I still I'm go back to you. Turtles versus De La Soul. They got completely sued for it. Yeah, or, or look what happened. But you know, it's not just a. There's definitely racism going on on a meta level because it's you know Afro diasporic musical logics versus Euro 
musical legends, but it happens to white people too. I mean, look at what happened to the Verve with Bittersweet Symphony. Oh yeah. Where you know Jagger and Richards, the the principals from the Rolling Stones, ended up owning 100% of that song wow. because a song that they stole from an American blues musician wow. had been turned into a, a symphonic song and played backwards and put into the back round of Bittersweet Symphony. It's totally wow. ridiculous. Holy smokes. Wow. Well, it just depends on who has the best lawyer, I guess. I think so. Yeah. Sadly, that's the case. Good gravy. So. so is this going to be the future? Is it going to be just, uh, we keep coming back to the corporation, now it's co corporation lawyers, you know. Um, is there, I, I like this concept of more of the mashup thing with more of the free society, kind of everybody put in their two cents and make some beautiful music that people could dig. Well, the, the beautiful thing about that ethic is that it's, it's fundamentally impossible to make a mashup legal. Right. right. I mean, so the people who are doing it are doing it without any hope of ever making any money, uh -huh. without any hope of ever being able to say, I'm the artist, here's my signature, this uh -huh. belongs to me. They do it out of pure love and desire to, you know, communicate and be part of a, a, a you know, a collective with one another. Uh -huh. And, you know, they're very excited about doing it and very into hearing each other's voices in the mixes. It's not like, the, it's not that the individual dissolves in the collective. It's like, I've got my spin on the collective, you've got your spin on the collective. And I think that really maps out what a future society could look like once we get over these crazy perversions that have driven Western culture for the last few centuries. Wow. Um, well, I, I keep on thinking of like the, the combo kind of like, uh, remember, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Jay-Z and Linkin Park, they did yeah, that, that combination great. thing. and So who gets the dough on that? Are they split that 50-50? What's oh, up yeah, with that? Yeah. That's a 50-50 thing. That's a, that's a pure corporate deal right there. Okay. Well, he's got he's to fund that, uh, that, that uh, next that money. Stadium. So, yeah, that net stadium. <laughs> he's got to do that thing. Yeah. All right. Um, so, Scott. Uh, for do you ever go through any sort of that, like people doing stuff for like real big fish songs or something like that, or some sort of mashup thing? I have yet to hear a real big fish mashup. That would be actually be awesome. I, I you encourage that? Yeah, totally. I you I know I mean, it. we're we're the kind of band that I mean, and I feel like we have you know maybe <laughs> most of the people that I know in the music industry are all in ska and reggae mm -hmm. bands, so it just you know kind of feels that way. But um, it's really about like getting the music to people. So it's like any way we can celebrate life and music all together, like, am I allowed to curse, by the way? Yeah, dude, this public act is go ballistic, Jesus. dude. Great. <laughs> <laughs> all right, because I have been trying to be so good. You don't understand, I have a, I, I make sailors blush. Uh, um, <laughs> but, no, any time, I mean, you know, music is life. Music is a life force all its own, and there's so many people out there trying to throw a lasso around it and like harness it. And we're man, we're strong, we're we control everything. You know, we're trying to control nature, even though we're a part of it. Whatever, it's a whole other conversation. But music is a life force that touches the human soul. So to think that we can touch that when we can't even find the human soul is well, pretty it's pretty ridiculous. Uh -huh. um, any way you can get down to it, you know what I mean? Like there are cats who cannot play any, you know, like I'm sure there are cats that couldn't play a musical instrument, but, but turntables made sense to them. You know what I mean? And like, I love hip hop. I love listening to somebody on the turntables who's, you know, mashing beats and, and, and making stuff happen with, mm -hmm. you know, an MPC and like, dude, I love it. It's amazing. You know what I mean? Like, and we, I, it's, so if somebody wants to mash up a real big fish tune with you know, make it with a pill first to it, and it would yeah, whatever. You know, you know, like, it. get it all. In Let's it. make the deal right here. On <laughs> you know, we're, we're all standing on the sh shoulders of giants. Like mm -hmm. anyone who says, you know, there can't be an original idea. You know what I mean? It's you know, it's you, all I been done of, before. You know, you think of like Jack Kerouac and his nonsensical words that he would throw into his poetry. But it's you know, you have to learn to speak before you can make up words on your own. And it's all you know, like, uh, you know. Music for music to continue to be music, there has to be music before it, and it can't. And it's not like the longer we go, the more this disappears back here. It's you know. Right. So, so how comfortable are you with people uh, doing uh, having unpermissioned uses of your compositions and recordings? It's that's a sticky wicket. Yeah, as long as you don't you know, sell it. I mean, because, 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 because it, well, and, and, I, and I have two opinions on it. In in I mean. When we were on a label, when we were on a major label, when we were on Jive, right. 
we saw nothing from record sales to begin with. Really? You know what I mean? So, I mean, like, partially with, like, illegal downloads and stuff like that, that's mm -hmm. how we got to Europe. Yep. Our record label didn't want to put the record out until uh, we toured over there, and our agency didn't want to book over there until the record was out over there. We were sitting in the U.S. and, like, getting fan mail and all sorts of stuff from all over Europe and the U.K., and we're like, what do we do? Luckily, we put our own money into it. We, like... It was one of the hardest tours I'd ever done because it was in the bitterest cold of winter. And uh, we spent, you know, we did, what, 35 shows in 36 days in a, in a van, in this Jesus. little itty bitty van. Done it. Uh, in the bitterest winter and like sleeping in the van sometimes because the ferry from Calais to Dover is like, you know, not for another like seven hours. Um, you know, and, and, it was only through people's illegal usage and spinning our stuff at like dance clubs and 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 you know getting our songs off of the internet and illegally that we even got noticed over there mm -hmm. and we had a fan base you know how did the label feel about that oh who cared i mean you know their job was to make money our job was to make music we were never going to see eye to eye i appreciate their job and they're doing what they're doing but you know like i got to be heard because if my music just sits there it doesn't do anybody any good you know and i'm not connecting with people and then i'm not an artist i'm just a lump right you know that's the job so you know now that we're independent we encourage people to buy the record from us and if they're going to utilize it like you know throw something our way because it's the only way we can continue. So it's basically a form of patronage. Right. At this point. It's mm -hmm. like respect, you know, like we do our job to respect by not like making people pay a bazillion dollars. I mean, we're not, you know, unfortunately we're not like, we don't have the opportunity to have the Fugazi ethic where, you know, record, you know, albums are nine ninety nine. You never pay more than ten dollars, you know, it's like, and you never pay more than five dollars for a show, but... What, wow. what about the, the Nine Inch Nails, Radiohead? Oh yeah, giving it away no. for free. You know what? How do you feel about I that? I thought Both that was amazing, and the thing, and, and I still paid as, as much, I still paid the full price for did it, you? you know? And I know a lot of people that did. And I know that they did all right with it, because, they, you know, they They made more money from downloads in one day than in downloads alone in one day than they made for all their albums combined in royalties. Hold it, but yeah, how, that's how did they do that? How did they do that? Because uh, Nine Inch Nails is giving the record away. Yeah, yeah, well, do one thing that people will hardly ever do, which is give the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. You treat people with respect, you get respect back. So, yeah, Nine Inch Nails put out, I think, um, a limited edition of, uh, like, super high-end box sets. And those sold out in, I think, three days and made a quarter of a million dollars wow. off of them. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, if, if, the fan, if you have that core of the fanatical, you know, music lovers who really connect with your work and you give them a way to demonstrate it through a transaction, they'll do it. Mm -hmm. But you, I mean, but you've got to have that groundwork laid, which so few bands are willing. Yeah, to Pearl do. Jam does the same thing. They've yeah. done like really great stuff with those. But these guys are huge, though. Mm -hmm. What is the little band? Do? True. That's, yeah. a, that's hey, you're that's, talking to the little band. That's the hard <laughs> thing. <That's laughs> much, you know, better known musicians than I am. And yeah. Yeah. What is what do you what does the little guy do? Uh, yeah. For, what can be done? Yeah. I mean, for for me, we you know we we got our music out on you know, Pandora and iTunes and you know uh, uh, the the nice thing about these. These, these environments is that, um, like Pandora is a great example, right? The majority of music on Pandora, uh, do you guys know it? It's the, yeah, the know, online radio station. Yeah, yeah. Got it right here. Yeah, is yeah, it's um, it's is independent, like non-label music, mm -hmm. not only non-major label, but like non-label. So you know, somebody who really likes uh, the music that you like is going to create a station out of that, and then they'll get served up your band uh, before you know it. And you know, the royalties are crap, but you don't, you're not in it for the royalties. You're in it to, to get the music out. And exactly. yeah. well, or, it's, or it's like Zoom. Yeah. That thing's amazing to me. Uh, What's that? It's, uh, it's, it's like, what is it? It's Sony's answer to the iPod. It's Microsoft. Microsoft. Yeah. And it's, you're not buying the music. You're leasing it is the essential idea. You pay $14 a month for unlimited, uh, downloads, wow. but you're not owning anything. You're leasing it. And anytime somebody plays one of your tunes on their Zoom thing, the moment they plug it back into their computer to either power it up or update it or what have you, information goes in and you get paid royalties from people listening to you on their Zoom player. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, I mean, like, it's a really brilliant idea. I, I have personal conflicts with the leasing of music idea. Mm -hmm. um, How come? 
I just for myself, like I can't lease music. Like I have to own it. But I mean, not yeah, to be too, you know. Too, I mean, like, I understand. It's all you ever really own anything, and, and no, I, mean, I mean, no, not anymore. But uh, you know, the difference between the files being able to be kept on a, an external hard, hard drive, drive of my own, yep. that you know, like even if I never buy another record, I won't have to keep shelling out fourteen dollars a month. Because once yeah. you stop paying the fourteen dollars a month, then boosh, the then you lose your music. Oh no! The, see, that sucks for me because I like to play the same song over and over and over and over again, and then next month play. You know, I like to yeah. hold on to it and put it everywhere. But that's—I mean, like you can have as much music as you want for fourteen dollars a month. But like how much money? I mean, I know for myself, on, can I, I make spend... a mix on a DVD? I mean, can I make a mix on, on a CD? No, no. then you're yeah. robbing them. Yeah, see? I no, mean, it's, like, it's yeah. DRM'd up the wazoo. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I you know, for a guy like me, I spend maybe like. I spend a grip on iTunes and records like a, a month, you know, mm -hmm. and and fourteen bucks would be like would make my wife happy. Ah. That's for sure. But you know, once again, like I, I wouldn't have. You but know, at the end of the month, yeah, I need to be able to do this and arrange this and have my music exactly where I want it yeah. when I want it now because I want it now. Well, yeah. they're they're pushing the, the everybody is kind of in the industry is pushing towards what uh, people call the great jukebox in the sky or the celestial jukebox. And the idea Ooh, is that concept. the music is all out there, and you can just kind of pull it in through any window. If you want to listen to it on your phone, if you want to listen to it on your stereo, in your car, or whatever. And in the, the the only question that we had the technology to do it. In fact, Google just bought a company uh, a few days ago called Simplify, which is really cool. What it does is you can keep your music on a hard drive at home and stream it to your phone over the internet. Really? Uh, and and they're already streaming it to Android phones. Like Google's launching this new Android music store. You might have heard about mm. it just like in the last day or two. Android? And is it Android? Android is Google's mobile operating system. Ah. So Android is like their answer to the iPhone. I see. I see. Uh, so anyway, Google ha now has what's called a cloud service. And my, and Apple just a few months ago bought this other cloud music service called Lala. Which used to be the oh yeah you remember yeah, Lala yeah, yeah. yeah you they let you play a song for free and then after that you gotta like you know buy you pay it or ten something. cents to stream it uh, yeah. or and really obscure stuff too that I really yeah and, or you could upload your entire collection to the internet and then listen to it streaming whenever and wherever you want hmm. but actually they just killed that service after buying it but that's going to be part of the next iTunes hmm. so everyone is pushing to get the whole enchilada up into the ether and then find a way to make you pay to pull it down. And it might not be leasing, it might just be, well, your music is there, but if you want access to, to it, you've got to pay us for the, the ones and zeros. Right. Um, but it, it's a very interesting moment in time, because we're about to hit that moment where you just can't get away from from access to music, right? which is the opposite of what the problem used to be. All right. All right but that also creates the issue of finding the Quality and the quantity. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. This is, I think, this is one of the major conversations that every musician has at least once a month. Is it's like you know, and you were talking about the small guys. You know, is it's like we watch these bands, like these little tiny guys, bust their humps, mm -hmm. and it ain't like when I started. You know, it's not like when we were kids, mm -hmm. and like, you know, there's so much of it out there, and and. To find the real quality stuff, you got it. It takes some time, you know. All right, gentlemen. Sorry to say this, man. This has been a fantastic episode, uh, but it's time for us to wrap up. So let's let's hear it for yourselves. Uh, uh, you want to plug anything real fast? I have nothing to plug, but uh, find me on Facebook, I guess, and <laughs> hopefully. Uh, oh, I'll be starting a, a, a new blog. So we'll look on to on Tumblr. All right. Com. All right, Cooley. Um. What am I doing? Oh, managing Father Goose. All right. Okay. And and Doctor? Doctor. Uh, my book, Mashed Up, is uh, going to be coming out in August. It's already available on Amazon for pre order. Why not? And, uh, and uh, I. Uh, excuse me. And your sister. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, let's hear something for Dinia quick. Okay. No, no, not my wife, who's oh, also sorry. got a bunch of really cool stuff. Oh, right. Stuff book. right I forgot. But, yeah. Look, we were talking before the show. My sister has a book coming out that's going to blow everybody's minds. Oh, it's my about, God. like, this lesbian married couple in Vermont in like 1820, and uh, it's going to totally change the way people think about gay marriage and American history, and it's also going to be super well written. Through that wow. Sounds. Okay, right. looking forward to that. <laughs> that All right, right. Uh, and I'm Chicken and, Doll, and uh, yeah. Is my yeah. Kind of yeah. Uh, do you want to? Do you know the title for it already? No, but her name is Cleves, Rachel Hope Cleves. All right, so so look for it. Look for that one. Sure. Thank you, guys, and this has been the Chuckboard Kids Show. Thank you. Yay! Yay! Thanks, Phil. Thank you, studio audience. Thanks.